All right, when you're looking at steel sections, there's a standard set of shapes that are produced by American steel manufacturers <clears throat> that have a very special uh, coating system to them. And so when you see a W24 by 68 as our steel section, what that's telling us is that we have a wide flange section. And what the wide flange means is that we have two parallel flanges where the inside surfaces are parallel to each other. The S shape does not. The inner surfaces are sloped. So the white flange ones are not. They're parallel to each other. Right? These outer fins are called the flanges. The pieces connecting those two are called the web. Now the designation in the U.S. Imperial units are that this next number, the 24, is the approximate depth. You might call it height, but we call it in the steel world the depth of the cross section, D, in inches. That would not be the case in the SI system, which it would be in millimeters in that case. Right? And then the next number, the 68, is approximately the self-weight of this cross-section per length in units of pounds per foot. Right, now that's <coughs> in the US Imperial units. If it was in the SI units, this would actually be the mass per meter. And that's not very convenient because if we're looking at self-weight, we want it in terms of the gravitational force, not the mass. So it's more convenient in the U.S. Imperial units here, pounds per foot. Now that would come from just taking this cross section that is, when we look it up, and we have these all kinds of tables that give us this information in the standard way. The manufacturers have a tolerance that they have to meet to call it that kind of section. This is a subset of all the wide flange shapes that are commonly produced in the U.S. or for the U.S. market. And you see here there's a 24 by 68 and has a cross-sectional area of 20.1 square inches, approximately. Right Now, <coughs> you could check that by adding up this, the area of these two rectangles and the rectangle of the web, so the flanges in the, by, in the, the, the web, by taking, of course, their width of the uh, each piece and then times the height. Now the thing is, is there's a little bit more area here right at the intersection. Those are actually rounded and not 90 degrees in a sharp corner, but rather rounded to reduce stress concentration and also match the profile of the rollers that come along to uh, hot roll these uh, sections. So this is an approximate area. If it's true, then the self-weight per foot then would be, of course, take the 20.1 square inches, convert it to square feet, so that would be what? One foot per 12 inches, and then we'll square that. Then times the unit weight of steel, which is 490 pounds per cubic foot, so the inch of squares goes away, we're left with feet squared, and then over feet squared over feet cubed means that we have the self weight per foot. And so let's check it out. 20.1 divided by 144 times 490 then would be about 68.4 pounds per foot or approximately 68 PLF pounds per lineal foot for that self weight. Right? Other properties that you see here we got the, the depth. Remember, that was only approximately 24 for this particular shape, 23.7 inch. And then we got the TW, that's the thickness of the web, at 0.415 inches. That's a designer's number. The fabricator would use this number in probably fractions of an inch because of tooling reasons. The width of the flange, 8.97, which is not going to be exactly that when you go measure things because the height of this little rectangle that is the flange, well, this is going to have a little rounded edge. So where do you take that width? It's some sort of an averaging kind of width, maybe. Right? And flange thickness. Right? So these are 
design per, uh, numbers when you see them in decimal the fabricator would use fractions and then you got these critical um, dimensions or per, rather properties of the uh, cross-section the second motive area about two different axes now the way this is set up in our steel manuals are that we always use in the white line shape that the strong axis the larger i sub x or rather the larger i value is the strong axis right and uh, when you get in the mechanics of materials you'll see exactly why that's the case but that larger one is the one that we decree is the xx centroidal axis and then we have the yy axis both of them are very important for all kinds of different behavior reasons right so the eyes are the centroidal second moments of area they do not have the bars over them to indicate that you're supposed to know what's going on um, and then you got these capital S's. Well, these S's are the elastic modulus for the cross section. And that's decreed to be I divided by C. Right now, I is, of course, what we just saw up here. And so SX would be equal to IX over the C value that corresponds to that axis. And that would be 1830 inches to the fourth divided by the C value is the distance from the X axis to the outer fiber, the farthest part away in the cross section, which would be one half of the height of the cross section. In mechanics and materials, you'll know that gets us to the largest stress, hence why we use it. 1830 times 2 divided by 23.7 then gives us 154.4 cubic inches or about 154 cubic inches as you see listed in the table. Right? The SY value then would be of course corresponding to that. That would be the IY divided by a C value, not the same one. That would be 70.4 inches to the fourth divided by, and now to go to the outermost extent piece away from the y axis, right? The measurement is perpendicular, would be half of the flange width. So that would be 8.97 inches divided by 2. <coughs> and so 70.4 times 2 divided by 8.97 is 15.7 cubic inches. And that's where those properties are. So that's just a convenient way to tabulate that thing uh, because we'll be using that ratio um, all the time.